Times change, and one either changes with them, or falls into the sands of history, left to be nothing but a memory to be forgotten. While the Inner Sphere had managed to stave off complete catastrophic collapse at the hands of the clans throughout much of the 31st and 32nd centuries, with only moderate leaps in technologies, this would not hold forever as the clans became more entrenched in the Inner Sphere, allowing them to gain access to large and powerful industrial bases, resources, and unrestricted and forced caste labor. To the native Inner Sphere powers, this would potentially spell disaster as their own military industrial bases became sluggish in response, especially after the Blakist Era and the Republic era that followed it, as that saw the military arms of most of the remaining successor states, barring the Capellan Confederation and to a lesser extent the Draconis Combine, atrophy. But in the former Free Worlds League, where combat was still rife throughout the succession wars to whom would reform the League, if it could be reforged at all, there was still innovation, despite reduced industrial output. These states, after all, had wars to win, against one another more specifically, and the mightiest amongst them, the Merrick Stewart Commonwealth, would embark in the 3130s, on the eve of its own destruction, on building a brand new battle mech that was theoretically meant to increase its military and industrial power to a new level. No one mech changes the outcome of entire wars, not typically anyway but it would be yet another feather in the cap of the army of the Merrick Stewart Commonwealth, for when it would bring the rest of the former League to heal. This would never truly come to pass, but the mech was designed, and would have a legacy beyond the state that built it. In this video, we are going to examine a machine that was born of a failed state, extreme overambition, and the desperation of the wars of the Eel Clan era. The battle mech to be examined, and its history, is Kalon Industries. Rock. Power in the former Free Worlds League had been distributed between a series of former duchies, which had been made into their own realms and during the Dark Age they struggled against the tides of potentially aggressive or opportunistic neighbors, as well as other successor states of this once great house. The Merrick Stewart Commonwealth, Duchy of Tamarind Abbey, the Regulan Fiefs, and the Orient Protectorate represented the largest and most powerful inheritors to the former Free Worlds League, and these were also the states most interested in reunifying with their neighbors but under their own command, to reconstitute what had been lost due to Thomas Merrick and Thomas Hallis's rule, the Free Worlds League. Influence from the outside, stemming from the Republic of the Sphere, but also from the Leering Commonwealth, attempted to keep the chaos and violence in the region going, fueling it with weapons, money, or clandestine actions. Still, it's not as though these states stood still outside of fighting and killing one another. The military-industrial capabilities of these nations remained reasonable, and especially was the case with the Merrick Stewart Commonwealth. In fact, much of the new innovative battle mechs to emerge from the former League during this time would emerge from the Commonwealth. The Eris, Anzu, and Giuliano were all examples of their willingness to tread where others had yet to in order to break new ground and find new military advancements towards achieving victory in the crisis of the former League. This spirit of problem solving and new ideas would not be abandoned, and in 3134, a contract would be issued by the army of the Merrick Stewart Commonwealth for a new heavy, or assault mech, between 75 and 85 tons, that would be meant to act as a mobile, heavily armed platform to support the already well-received Giuliano and other Free Worlds League heavy assets in combat. Earthworks, Irian Battle Mechs Unlimited, and Kalon Industries would all make bids in an attempt to capitalize on the contract, 
though it was understood from the start that Irian would almost certainly win the competition. Eartech, the owners of Irian Battleworks Unlimited, had a favored place amongst the manufacturers in the Commonwealth, being the company that built the Giuliano and being so heavily invested in by the various components of House Merrick still within the Merrick Stewart Commonwealth. Their facilities on Angel 2 as well seemingly were poised to expand production to include a new assault mech, the Eartech proposed machine, the KY-N1 Kenyon, was meant to be a follow-up, and was named for the Captain General who saw the League through the fall of the Star League, and into the First Succession War. The only problem was, the Kenyon was an absolute travesty. From here I just want to add, it appears that Eartech had made several significant payments to officials across the procurement process, in the form of gifts, and even sea bills directly at the time with the presumption that these gifts would have the desired response of positive support for their bid over their competition. Laziness and the presumption that they would capture the contract saw them build a mech that met none of the AMSC's criteria, beyond promising its domestic production on Angel 2. In fact, it borrowed heavily from the Giuliano without deviating enough to truly justify its existence. Worse still, the concept was so poor, and so badly handled, that they were unable to even complete its trials for officers as their prototype ceased functioning several times. Mid-test. But they did assure the army of the Merrick Stewart Commonwealth that upon acquiring the contract, their Kenyan battle mech would be made viable for service. Within seven years. This left an opening for earthwork as well as Kalon Industries, even without nearly matching the kinds of bribes and lobbying which Eartech had engaged in, with the latter having, unbeknownst even to their executives, a superb battle mech on offer. They'd assembled a team to design a battle mech under a veteran designer from Thermopolis, senior engineer Jaromir Malan. Jaromir had been working for Kalon Industries' Merrick branch for 30 years by this time, and had been a part of the project that saw the adaption of the Hell over to the Eris for the company. And he also had a very clear vision for what they could do. The Commonwealth had asked for a mobile, heavily armed platform, and instead of simply putting a large engine into a 75 or 80 ton chassis, he believed the path forward would be to focus on the jumping element of the battle mech, much like the Eris did in its own weight bracket. The real problem was, Kalon itself hadn't had much experience working with chassis that were designed to do this, and building things from the ground up was very difficult. Instead, they would take a major shortcut by borrowing from their clan counterparts, in the form of blatantly plagiarizing and stealing many structural design elements of a clan second line assault mech, the Phoenix Hawk 2C. The chassis was nimble for its size, already prepared for long distance jumps for its weight, and had spacious internals for myriad weapon systems. Major modifications would be made to the stolen idea and the chassis' end appearance was different in many ways, especially as Kalon mostly used inner sphere technologies and methods to build it, rather than, of course, clan. It also required them to build their own reinforced armored cockpit, as this had been requested by the AMSC for the machine, and there would be a major undertaking to adjust the body of the mech to accommodate this. The Giuliano, a mech made by Eartech, already had this feature, but they were hardly going to share the patent on their specific method of making this happen. The conclusion of these developments and shortcuts was the OR-1X Orel, an 85-ton assault mech with a partial wing system, endowing the mech with the ability to consistently leap up to 150 meters. It was more or less the combination of a Phoenix Hawk 2C, the Eris's partial wing system, and a reasonably gunned assault mech platform. The first prototype was constructed in time for trials and a demonstration for the AMSC, and much to the utter shock to Kalon Industries, the contract would be awarded to their firm, rather than to Eartech. One thing that wouldn't be caught until much later, however, was that Kalon's armored pod method of an armored cockpit had a deadly flaw, 
in that it caused multiple issues with the ejection system. This ironically meant that pilots were more likely to survive incoming fire, or even non-head destruction of their mechs, but if they needed to eject, the odds were not always in their favor. While Kalon's executives were in a state of disbelief, the staff certainly weren't, with Jaromir having been confident in his work from the very start. Apparently, even before the trials, he'd bought several expensive bottles of wine in order to celebrate with his team, knowing the outcome, as he would say. Eartek, by contrast, had been dumbstruck and was furious at the unforeseen turnabout, which was demonstrated by the fact that they would take legal action against the Merrick Stewart Commonwealth even, claiming that the competition had been in some way rigged in favor of Kalon, which was beyond ironic, especially given that Eartek was all but publicly known for having paid for favors to actually acquire the contract, and more or less had put out a bid that would have been unacceptable under any reasonable conditions. In other words, had they won the contract, bribery would have been the only reason as to why. There would be, within a year, a reshuffling of their Merrick Stewart Commonwealth board as a result of this failure. And due to the bad PR of even being associated with the defeat of the Kenyan. But for the winner, this didn't mean that the Orel would immediately go into production. Alterations were made, as per the AMSC's requests, and the OR1L Orel would enter a final prototype phase, with two example models being constructed in 3137 on Thermopolis, only months before Operation Hammerfall. Thermopolis would fall to a joint wolf and assault during the invasion, with the two prototypes being put desperately into the field as a last line of defense. Both units would underperform, not that they had much of a chance to begin with, and they would be destroyed. The line for assembly for the mechs would never be completed, and was repurposed later to begin the manufacturing of the clan's Alpha Wolf battle mech. Lead engineer Jaromir Milan, the creator of the battle mech, and a declared patriot of the Merrick Stewart Commonwealth, would be executed during the occupation of Thermopolis under unknown conditions, and much of his and his team's work would be destroyed, barring what had been documented about the OR-1X, the original prototype, the one which had been demonstrated to the AMSC, the OR-1X, had been shipped to loyalty before the invasion for final assessment and decommissioning. With it, the original design and build specifications had been sent as well, the first preliminary work. In the chaos of the continued assault of Operation Hammerfall, plans to scrap the mech would be halted, and instead, the machine would be placed into storage. Loyalty and its major industrial manufacturing assets would hold out in the face of the Wolf Onslaught, and became the last great outpost of Kalon Industries in the Restored League space. Production of the Eris would gradually move here as well, further cementing its importance. It would only be in 3150, when a new contract came up for the Free Worlds League, that the Orel would be used as the basis for a repurposed new battle mech. I have helped build a machine that can face anything the world can throw at it. It is the future of the Commonwealth, and one day, my children, or my children's children, will see this great eagle standing in front of a league, restored to its rightful place. Jaromir Milan, two weeks before Operation Hammerfall. Though only prototypes were built, the 85-ton OR-1L Orel would have been a relatively competent asset for the Free Worlds League, had it been constructed in 3137 as planned. At the time of its assembly, it was meant to keep pace with the more powerful designs of the Republic of the Sphere, as well as clan battle mechs that were becoming increasingly common in the region. The recognized issue, of course, being that the army of the Merrick Stewart Commonwealth, while being well built to fight Lyran or other regional forces, would struggle against these more sophisticated adversaries. Using the most advanced technologies available to them, the Orel was set to spread its wings and fly, 
had it not been for the fall of Thermopolis and the collapse of the Army of the Merrick Stewart Commonwealth. Due to limitations of critical space, the OR-1L has a standard gyro and internal structure. In order to keep the mech cool, it has 13 double heat sinks, and under normal conditions this is further enhanced by its partial wing system, letting it cool up to a respectable 29 per turn. Mirroring the Eris, one of the mechs that was a great inspiration for it, it has a Garrett T-20C communications package and a Garrett A-6 targeting and tracking suite. It is unknown at this time if the OR-1L had any quirks due to incomplete documentation as to its construction. In regards to mobility, the mech was powered by a 13.5 ton Hermes 340XL fusion engine, giving it a maximum speed of 64 kilometers per hour. This is reasonable for its weight and size, and would allow it to keep pace with frontline battle mech formations. The real gem it had was its four standard jump jets, along with its advanced partial wing system, letting the mech leap up to 150 meters per turn. In other words, letting it jump like a nimble medium or heavy, rather than an assault mech. This was vital for producing movement defensive bonuses, as well as letting the mech get into position and out of trouble. In regards to its physical defense, the Orel was almost over-prepared. For fighting against the most advanced Republic designs and even clans, special attention was paid in this sense. It would adopt an armored cockpit like the JLN series of mechs from its competitor, EarTech, though of Kalon's own design. It would then do everything it could to diminish the impact of enemy energy weapon fire, as well as PPCs. To accomplish this goal, it installs reflective plating on board, and a full 15 tons of it, giving the mech 240 points of armor. This means it takes half damage from energy weapons fire, but more impressively, the Orel installs a blue shield projector, giving it the opportunity to further reduce incoming PPC fire. This means when it's activated, the Orel functionally takes almost no damage from enemy PPCs. A clan PPC, or heavy PPC, would only do 4 damage to this mech, making it nearly impotent. There are drawbacks to both blue shield and reflective armor, but it would be assumed that the mech's mobility would keep these systems from being strained by their weaknesses. Once things get into firepower, the OR-1L prospered from having advanced weaponry, including a clan-quality LRM system. To start with, mounted in the left arm, it does indeed have a Clan LRM-20 launcher with Artemis 4 fire control system. The offensive tool had two tons of ammunition as well, which was hidden behind a Case 2 system. Its other primary weapon was a right arm mounted heavy PPC with capacitor, letting it strike out for as much damage as an AC-20 every other round of fire, and it can also fire the PPC at a lower setting every turn. As a set of backup weapons, it had a medium X-Pulse laser installed into the head, and two small X-Pulse lasers installed into the right torso. The mech was very competent at the mobile direct fire role it was intended to do, especially when it came to weathering fire from energy-based battle mechs and vehicles. Mobile enough to be hard to hit, heavily gunned enough to savage heavy mechs in particular, and using advanced technologies. In theory, the Orel was the total package. It just never went into full production. Its only battlefield deployment was a disappointment when Clan Wolf overwhelmed Thermopolis. When the two examples of these mechs were deployed, they would be utterly savaged within minutes, facing a full Clan Star of heavies. Their performance was so poor, the wolves themselves never bothered to take note of the design leaving them as scrap to be broken down later. Despite the collapse of the Merrick Stewart Commonwealth, other elements of House Merrick would unify under the Orient Protectorate to reconstruct the Free Worlds League. In this reforged state, the League would go to war with its neighbors once more, and doing so by first pushing back against the Steiners and the Wolves, who were now at one another's throats as well. Operation Homecoming, as it was called, would have some successes, but sadly, eventually, 
This ended in the dire consequences of a crushing defeat at the hands of the Wolf Empire on New Olympia, and the death of the Warden General Thaddeus Merrick. This left huge sways of the League's territory, and some of the most industrially important worlds inside of its traditional borders, in the hands of the Empire, which had assaulted their region in the late 3130s. But it also meant that the League would have time to lick its wounds and reorient its resources towards new projects. Kalon itself would be going through a process of reorganizing, shifting production of several lost mech designs from Thermopolis over to facilities on loyalty, as well as looking to keep income rolling in from the restored League, which now presided over their assets. It would be in 3146 that the legacy of Jaromir Milan and his team would begin to play a role in the military once more. This time, more specifically, the Free World's League military. The League had a real problem, and that it was bordering an aggressive, powerful state that was growing fat on the industrial assets of the now lost Merrick Stewart Commonwealth. While many inside of the Free World's League military were dithering, and potentially even the Captain General, General Elias Kostakis, one of the few leaders seemingly concerned enough to be drawing up war plans with the Wolf Empire, would demand that the League begin the process of building several anti-clan dedicated battle mechs, including one which he conceptually named, quote, the Storm, unquote, claiming that they needed a mech for assault breakthroughs and to act as a counter-breakthrough mech. To start with, we require a mech with mobility and firepower that is technologically sophisticated enough and powerful enough to destroy the so-called Empire and restore the rule of the eagle over its ancestral worlds. General Kostakis, 3146, and a letter to the Office of Military Procurement on Atreus. Kostakis wasn't just asking for a single mech, but an entirely new way of warfare, unfamiliar to the League, which he called the Phalanx Doctrine. Heavier, long-range, modern battle mechs would act as an anvil, as lighter, nimbler, but highly dangerous light and medium assets would swarm over enemy positions, resulting in what he called, quote, success, unquote. In a way, this was a major expansion and evolution of the ideas behind the hammer and the anvil. But alternatively, this would also work for breakthroughs, using the aspis as the battering ram, and allowing lighter elements to exploit the opening. He himself had taken an eye to Kalon Industries' heiress, as he designed and proposed a reorganized company formation of ideal battle mechs per role for tackling clan adversaries, built around the battle mech in its various forms. However, the real problem was, there were few domestically produced assault mechs to fill the role of his quote, aspis, unquote, claiming Free World's League assault mechs either lacked mobility or the technological edge to act in such a role, and, as an interim, recommended using the awesome series of battle mechs until suitable machines could be commissioned and delivered. He claimed simply that innovation would be that which delivered the Free World's League from its historic shortcomings in military and industrial matters. In 3147, after several years of openly discussing the subject, and gaining notoriety from some of his peers in managing a series of border skirmishes with the Wolf Empire and Marian Hegemony, Kostakis would be put on the Defense Procurement Committee in the Free World's League military, as an advisor to the government. While he would push for a war machine that could act as the aspis he had proposed in his doctrines, others on the board were less enthused with the idea. An order came from on high, however, that the League military would be looking for a new mech in each weight class. Capitalizing on this, Kostakis was focused on getting what he wanted, a Titan to absorb punishment and deliver it, unlike anything else the League had in its arsenal. When the bidding process began, there would be some questions as to if Kalon would even commit to a design. Years had been spent working on reorganizing loyalty, and dealing with the situation in the Wolf Empire regarding their subsidiary on Thermopolis. Inside of the League proper as well, they only had a handful of teams able to tackle any one new project. Regardless, 
senior engineer Andre Radu would make the case to one of their more ambitious and young executives at the company, junior vice president of innovation and production, Julian Sander, as to the importance of competing for the most prestigious contract. Normally, these initiatives came from higher management, but Radu was an equally ambitious man himself and saw potential for his own advancement in the company. In fact, he had already come up with a plan to win the contract in question when the proposals had made their way to them. Julian informed Radu in response that if he and his team, within one month, could come up with a proposal, he would do what he could to push the company to enter the bid at higher tiers of competition, rather than just languishing in the light and medium contracts the company was currently aiming for. Andre was relieved, though immediately got to work. This was something he'd already quietly started to do prior to the contract anyway. The Orel, the 85-ton forgotten machine from Calon over a decade earlier, was a great basis for what he'd envisioned, and he'd looked at the old prototype and plans for it for years after discovering it, because he had seen the potential in its original design. Simply put, Radu asked a few questions of this mech upon seeing it. Why not put more weapons on it? Wouldn't it be a better platform if that was the case? Why isn't it heavier? Rather than aiming to be a graceful gliding giant with reflective armor for energy attacks, it would become a colossus, built as a dedicated weapons platform with the deadliest weapons packages available, and it would make it all the more versatile, able to handle multiple situations by being constructed as an Omnimech. Major design changes would take place to the body of the Orel in it becoming bulkier and heavier to support its 100 ton frame. Its speed would also decrease as the engine was not given priority in order to feed its offensive systems, making it the destructive platform Radu's team at Kalon now envisioned it as. However, Andre and his team would retain the partial wing system, seeing it as vital to the mech's cooling and giving it an edge of mobility over similar jumping assault mechs that may come into competition with it, both at market and on the battlefield. This new Orel would be a brutalizing behemoth, with multiple potential roles to be fitted inside of a changing battlefield between missions. From open fields with long-range duels, to the vicious close quarters of urban combat, this battle mech would be able to participate provided there was a logistics chain to support it. For Kalon Industries itself, it was even better, as it would mean that one mech could have nearly unlimited support options sold for it, increasing the profitability of each machine. The battle mech's concept would be ready for the proposal to the government, and would impress Kalon's board after it was presented by Sandor. The war machine would be put on offer to the League as a part of their contract competition. Marketing, interestingly enough, is also a major component of if a battle mech will be adopted or not. As with Eartech naming the Giuliano the way they did, credibility can be found in a name. While Andre and his team didn't realize this, or cared frankly, Julian Sandor certainly did, and insisted that the designation for the mech be changed from the OR series, or Orel series, a name meaning Eagle in Czech or Russian, over to a name adopted by Paul Masters from the Knights of the Inner Sphere for his Phoenix Hawk, the Rock. Its naming convention made sense in more ways than one, too. Namely, the Phoenix Hawk 2C was a descendant of the Phoenix Hawk and was the primary inspiration and basis for the original chassis, with many of its design features still being visible in the mech. This would play up its heritage to the venerable design and attach its history to a prominent hero of the League's past. Another smart marketing ploy by Kalon was to describe the Rock as an alternate, all-encompassing breakthrough mech, which was a far better substitute to Super Heavy designs. They would make the claim when pushing sales that this monstrous Hulk was a true Titan Killer, as despite its cost, it was still much cheaper than most Super Heavy machines that could compete with it, even into the future. Internally, for the Free Worlds League military, as a result of this line of marketing, it created the idea that the Rock was a superb mech for elite or veteran mech warriors. As stated before, the team itself didn't really see any of this, 
but so long as the mech was a success, they didn't really care. When its prototype was put into trial in 3148, it met and exceeded its competitors once more from EarTech, though this time not because EarTech had botched their own bid, but because this new mech, the R0 series, or the R01X, the Rock, would come out as a superb machine. By 3148, the League, hesitantly, would award the contract to Kalon Industries, with an expectation of deliveries of the mech to the Free Worlds League military annually. It was anticipated that in the first year of production, only four would be constructed, and at its peak procurement and assembly, the League only ever intended to acquire six to 12 per year, at least as of their plans for 3155. The first mechs were expected to be delivered in 3150. They would also be barred from export to foreign entities or mercenary units, much like was done with the Giuliano, seeing the mech as being a vital national interest. It was also noteworthy that Kalon promised that the mech, once it went into full manufacturing and assembly, would use much more clan tech level components than the prototype had. While this made a major impact on the League in adopting the mech, the truth was, at the time, Kalon had not entirely been sure they could deliver on this front. A scramble took place after their achievement in taking the contract, especially since a stipulation of it was that all components needed to be sourced from within League space. This, even at first, seemed like it wouldn't be possible. It would take time and a dedicated effort on behalf of Mr. Sandor reaching out to other equipment producers across the region, but this was made possible piece by piece. For instance, a contract with Technicron would yield Clantech level double heatsinks. There would also be a series of contracts and acquisitions made within the year to ensure that the mech met League standards. The two most important appear to be acquiring a license to build a new series of Clantech VLR 300XL engine, the same model of engine which powered the AS8S Atlas in fact, and it would be constructed once more by Technicron, in this case on the planet of Savannah. The other key technology was the ability to domestically source Clantech level Gauss weaponry. These Gauss weapons came from a company named Kraken Electromagnetic Technologies, which emerged in the Duchy of Tamarind Abbey in the latter portions of the 3140s, and was one that had several major legal disputes with Clan Seafox, which were making claims of intellectual property theft from the company. Kraken EMT, however, would eventually receive the backing of the Duchy of Tamarind Abbey itself and allowed for Duke Fontaine Merrick and his surrogates to purchase a 51% stake in the company. This would lead to a wholly legitimate result within the League's court system of the legal dismissal, with prejudice, of the Sea Fox lawsuits. The Sea Foxes would lodge an official complaint to the Free Worlds League and to the Duchy of Tamarind Abbey over this, but nothing would come of it, at least so far. These key attributes also said nothing of what is often overlooked by many analysts, which are its onboard advanced targeting and tracking systems, or even its reinforced leg structures. Though it is noteworthy to point out, as of yet, the flaws from the original Aurel, with its armored cockpit, have yet to be resolved, even in this newer, heavier, and more sophisticated battle mech. With these key items in place, by 3151, the first of these new juggernauts began walking off the assembly line. General Kostakis himself was relieved when the mech finally entered production, and would attempt to focus their distribution to elite units like the Free World's Guards first. This plan was to be the case for the first decade of manufacturing of the mech, before, if successful, the mech would begin to be found in other Free World's League military units with time. Unbeknownst to him, safe would have other ideas for the mech, and took the first batch for themselves. Of its original production run of four, three would be taken by SAFE, the Free Worlds League's security and intelligence organization, to be distributed to an insurgency group within the Wolf Empire, 
known as the Army of the Merrick Union. A radical nationalist entity made up of locals from within the Wolf Empire, and headed by a former AMSC officer, who also happened to be a distant cousin to House Merrick itself. When the conflict ignited in 3151 across the region, before the central government of the League would become fully involved, the AMU would deploy these mechs in a handful of key engagements that showed just how brutal they could be. The Orel Legion, a shock unit made up of one of the more brutal fragments of the AMU, would use the mechs to horrifying effect in the landing on Jlen in 3152. Jlen, a little-known world near Preston, was a vital defensive point for the Wolves by the time of this campaign, and its fall could result in several more key systems being lost. The planet itself only had a population of 28 million people, but it did have two significant urban centers on this otherwise lush, though often cold and stormy world. Under the League, its key exports had been high-quality ore and timbers. On this battlefield, there would be a face-off between the 34th Garrison Cluster, as well as the 109th Defense Cluster, against a joint operation force of the Army of the Merrick Union's Orel Legion and Sons of Thermopolis, as well as the 7th Free World's Curious Ears. The Curious Ears, a more recent unit formed after the reunification of the Free World's League from many of the repatriated independent worlds near the Steiner and Wolf border, were considered a reliable regular regiment, though a slightly understrength one. Safe had believed that the planet was only defended by the 109th Defense Cluster, as well as several Salhama independently formed units, and had not taken into account the potential presence of additional forces like the 34th Garrison Cluster, which had been repositioned to the location in anticipation of an attack from the League, or from League-aligned mercenaries and insurgents. More frustrating to the Free World's League attempt was the disunity between League units, even prior to the landing and military intelligence failure. The Curious Ears were the higher command in the operation, with Colonel Oliver Wright being an overall charge of the mission. Wright, who had very minimal frontline combat experience, had an extremely negative view of the AMU, viewing them as future enemies of the League rather than useful puppets and he also viewed them as unreliable in the extreme. He said, for instance, of the Sons of Thermopolis, They are a band of traitors and miscreants, with the delusion of importance and prestige. Of the Orel Legion, it was orders of magnitudes worse. They are abominations draped in human flesh and attire. I trust them to sooner shoot us in the back than fight alongside us. They only talk to one another in a local language, and at every moment, I think they are imagining how to kill us. That we fight alongside these creatures gives me pause as to how just our cause can be, if these are whom we fight alongside. The feelings appeared mutually disdainful from his allies' perspective as well. Unfortunately for Oliver's command and the strike force, at the opening of the offensive, the League units departed from the landing zone and began their primary offensives towards five key positions. Their entire right flank would collapse under a well-placed counter-assault by the 109th Defense Cluster. The breakdown took place past the Temni Forest, near the Smagard Plains, as one company was routed from the 3rd Battalion of the Free World's Curious Ears, and another was annihilated in the face of two binaries from the defense cluster. No clan mechs were lost in the fighting, reorganizing into a single binary to compensate for their damaged battle mechs. They would push forward, guided by local aerospace assets, with the intention of striking at the landing zone itself. This was, of course, the Coalition's primary logistics hub as well as the center for their command and control for the operation at this stage of the attack. Colonel Wright had left almost no forces as a reserve, assuming most of the enemy resistance would be crushed under their numbers, and being unaware of how close the two sides were in terms of fighting power. There would almost be the order to depart given to the dropships, cutting off their own forces from resupply, 
but one unit was able to break away to intercept the incoming binary and to buy time for the remaining forces to reposition. It was only a single lance that had lagged behind the main force, composed of three rocks and one battlemaster, of the Orel Legion. The lance had been led by one Lieutenant Boris Jurak in his BLR, a survivor of the army of the Merrick Stewart Commonwealth and a veteran of Operation Hammerfall, and he would inform command that his unit would intercept the clan forces by passing through the Temni Forest. This dense terrain would have been almost impossible to traverse had it not been for the rock's partial wing system. Clan aerospace assets had even picked up on this unit on the other side of the forest before being intercepted by Free Worlds League aerospace assets themselves, and identified them as three warhammers and a battlemaster. It was calculated by the clans that their binary would only come into contact with these defenders at the very base of the drop zone, if they managed to make it back at all. This was considered moderate and insubstantial resistance to halt their strike at the very heart of the invasion, and Star Captain Victor, at the head of the binary, opted to keep the push going. A win here for his unit would potentially result in a strategic victory and would stop the assault on their world. Instead of achieving this operational success, however, the ambush at the Saphir River took place only two hours later, just as night had started to settle in. Three rocks, piloted by three veteran mech warriors, and in various configurations, would ambush the defense cluster forces, killing Star Colonel Victor in the first volley from their hidden positions across the river, annihilating his dominator in a storm of violence. The pilots, namely Sergeant Major Vasek Contempt Radomir Sevekt, Lieutenant Tatiana Erika Gashpir, and Sergeant Augustin Dvorak Merrick, would be the mech warriors who were in charge of this slaughter. An enormous conflagration of violence broke out between the two forces after the opening shots, even as the wolves fell into disorganization from the moment the firefight started. Confused sensors read unknown mechs as warhammers, or even as Phoenix Hawk 2Cs, without being able to identify them correctly as blistering levels of intense fire tore through the unit one by one. Explosions rocked the pristine, natural landscape as mech's reactors were breached. Using the element of surprise, highly skilled pilots, and brand new advanced war machines, the rocks knocked out nine enemy mechs. Only a single storm crow would escape the battle, piloted by a mech warrior named Yurik, a Sibco cadet who had been accelerated to the position of mech warrior, as many had been in the Empire in order to fill desperately needed holes in the line. He had survived through cowardice, and while he and his battle computer could report back the mechs they'd faced, he would struggle to face the shame of his dishonor. The after-action report by the League, after examining the battlefield once the situation was secured, found the mechs to be delightfully effective, but determined that the wolf pilots had been executed without questioning by the rocks given what was found regarding human remains, or blown out cockpits, even on mechs that were clearly disabled earlier. This did not match the Orel Legion's story that the wolf pilots had taken flight, or that they had been killed through battlefield headshots and mech takedowns. Later on, it was overheard by several curious ears that Svatek, the best pilot of the three mech warriors that had faced down the binary, had simply said, Listen to these soft leaguers whine. This is how nations lose. They complain that we won. There is no crime in victory. In another three weeks of fighting, the capital city, Victoria, would be the last bastion of defenders for the wolves. Predictably and sadly for them, the 34th Garrison Cluster had bowed out of the fighting early on after taking significant losses in the first two weeks. Their retreat from the world had left the remaining 109th as the last defenders of the planet. Star Colonel Emilinia had promised Othar that the world would hold as a part of the overall defense of Preston, and from there forward, Thermopolis. Despite her cowardly counterparts in the 34th Garrison Cluster departing, and not fighting to the last mech and bullet, she hoped their departure would bring about reinforcements. But that would still be weeks away, if they came at all. 
On the side of the League, the fighting had cost them dearly as well. Many of their infantry assets had been torn apart, and they'd relied on pressing locals into service with promises of land and other benefits for having supported their rightful government. In terms of mechs and vehicles, it'd been more than costly. The Curious Ears had been maimed, losing over 50% of their mech forces. The Sons of Thermopolis had lost a full company of mechs and vehicles, amounting to a third of their forces. And the self-declared Countess of Thermopolis, who goes by the adopted name of Theodora Lascaris, would opt to only peripherally participate in the taking of Victoria, believing it was more appropriate that she rebuild her forces for the campaign to come, rather than spending more of it to beat an entrenched enemy on a world she didn't pretend she had a claim to. It would be the remnants of the Free World's Curious Ears, and their abhorred ally, the Orel Legion, that would be left to take the city. To the Curious Ears and Colonel Oliver Wright, they'd wanted to engage the wolves as gently as possible. This was not the case for their allies. The wolves' numbers were diminished in terms of mechs and battle armor, and they would be relying themselves on press-ganged Salhama infantry units, as well as old garrison armored vehicles to fill gaps in the city. To the Legion, however, led by Captain Robert Lorenz, the objective was to take the city, and to do so as quickly and, quote, effectively, unquote, as possible. The Legion would enact the Phalanx Doctrine for the assault, pairing rocks with heiresses for the attack into the city, as well as bringing in heavy aerial and artillery bombardments on any position that displayed resistance that was not able to move or reposition quickly. When this tactic was used correctly in the battle, it overwhelmed every attempt the 109th made to defend their positions, especially when the air support component was a part of the assault. The three rock battle mechs themselves were equipped for close quarters engagements, and with horrifying results for any mechs, infantry, or vehicles that came across their paths. The battle was a ruthless, bitter firefight that dragged on for two weeks even after the city had been encircled and half taken. Streets were taken one at a time in the fighting, before the climactic encounter near the central administration building, where a rock, piloted by Vasek Svatek, would dispatch Star Colonel Emilienia in her Warwolf, before killing Yurik, the mech warrior who'd lost his nerve and now found his courage. The Orel Legion took 50% material losses in terms of mechs and equipment in the city, with multiple pilots wounded or killed, and their infantry component was truly decimated. They seemed unbothered by the losses of their compatriots, however. The city itself was a half-blasted ruin by the end of the fighting. The people had been liberated, but were now put under occupation by the AMU, rather than the Free World's League directly. The shooting war Wright feared almost came to pass, until orders came down the chain within a few days. They were to let the insurgents have the world. It was considered unimportant for the moment. They would solve the disputes brought about by these actions later. The battle was over. Over half of the 34th had been killed, and the 109th had been completely removed from the order of battle holding the city, dying for the last foothold of a vital world their commander had promised Othar they would hold. For the League and its allies, the results were equally grim. The Free World's League Curious Ears would take years to rebuild, with huge losses of men and material. And the AMU forces too had taken serious losses, but seemed eerily confident that they could replace them. But there was one thing decisively displayed by the campaign, both in the ambush at the Severe River, but also in the thickest of the fighting in the gruesome Battle of Victoria and that was that the Rock played a decisive role in dismembering clan battle mechs in the thick of the fighting. In the entire conflict over the campaign, one Rock would nearly be knocked out by losing its left torso, and another would see the mech's head badly damaged, almost killing one of the pilots, save for its armored cockpit. Beyond this, each one of these mechs tallied multiple kills across multiple battles. This information was relayed to the League for a full breakdown of its performance by Major Samira Nori, the safe liaison officer to the AMU. It would play an important role in implementing the mech's use in further battles during the war. 
the first Free World's Guard, would deploy the rock three months later to terrifying effect in their advance on the Wolf Empire. The 100-ton Inner Sphere Assault Omnimech known as the Rock is a terrifying specter on any battlefield it treads upon. Using advanced technologies, including consistently incorporated clan-grade equipment, this Titan was built to break any and all opposition that the Free Worlds League military would come across. A true breakthrough mech, there is little that can stand in its path, especially when the machine is deployed with the appropriate formation. To begin with its core features, in order to save on critical space, which is vital for this battle mech given how much of it is consumed by several of its core chassis features, it uses a standard internal structure and gyro. The R-Series 100 standard chassis that makes up its internal structure, however, does yield it an additional bonus in the form of one of the advanced rules. Outside of this, the Rock can rely on its armored cockpit to keep the pilot safe, often even through the destruction of the mech, beyond its notorious flaw regarding ejections, that is. Several Rock pilots by 3155 have discovered, to their dismay, that reactor breaches are very much unforgiving, especially when you're unable to punch out to escape them. Looking at heat management, in most configurations the Rock runs extremely cool, it has 12 base heat sinks, letting it cool 24 per turn, but its partial wing system enhances that by another 3, letting it actually reduce its heat by 27 per turn under ideal conditions. When factoring in that it can add heat sinks as needed as well, most configurations of the rock, with one notable exception, will run below their heat thresholds, or having to just bracket appropriately. In terms of pod space, 40% of the entire volume of the mech is available for weaponry, or additional onboard systems per configuration. This is an ample amount of tonnage to do just that, especially when factoring in the advanced technologies most variants offer it. 40 tons may not be a perfect total of weaponry for pure inner sphere tech on a bruising assault mech, but with wise and shrewd allocations of this weight, and mixes of advanced defensive options, this is more than enough tonnage to bring down even the hardiest of opponents. As far as electronic systems are concerned, the Rock is incredibly well served. For its communication systems, it comes with a Star Fury 2 communications and control package. And aside from this, the R04C has a new Eagle Eye Multi Seeker 7 targeting and tracking system. And that is further interlinked with its enhanced 3D rangefinding optic lens system too. In total, its targeting and tracking system gives the Rock most of its core advanced features. In regards to quirks, the Rock has an abundance. First, it has reinforced legs, which help it perform death from above actions. This was actually not done for the express purpose of this physical attack, but because the mech is expected to be jumping frequently, and reinforcing this was done to limit how often the mech's legs needed to be rebuilt as a result. After this, it has the multi-track feature as a part of its advanced targeting system, as well as the variable range targeting trait, both of which are linked with its four lenses displayed on the torso of the mech, which can often be mistaken for lasers. Finally, it suffers from the difficult ejection trait, due to its flawed armored pod that gives it its armored cockpit. It also suffers as well from having non-standard parts. Even decades after its production, many components inside of the rock are simply extremely artisan in their crafting and limited in their availability. While the rock may not be the quickest 100 ton assault mech, it is surprisingly agile and has the ability to reorient itself on the battlefield with more vigor than its opposition may be prepared for. To obtain this functionality, many sacrifices had to be made with onboard critical spaces. But in the end, the Rock benefits at least somewhat from it. Looking at how the R04C more specifically manages this, and starting with its power plant, the Rock is driven forward by a 9.5 ton Velar Clantec 300 XL fusion engine. This gives the mech a maximum speed of 54 kilometers per hour, or 5 movement points in the tabletop game. And that's not so bad for a 100-ton assault mech, 
though it is slower than the typical pace of battle for standard intersphere formations. This regulates its role more into a breakthrough or counter-breakthrough machine, which is exactly the purpose the mech was built around. Where things start to change, though, is that the rock does possess a partial wing system, a leftover from its short-lived ancestor, the Aurel. When combined with its three Gryphon 9 thrusters, this allows the rock to leap up to 120 meters, or four movement points in the tabletop game. While these won't allow it to receive a maximum jumping defensive bonus, it does mean it can traverse terrain with ease, or can reposition on the fly to either gain an advantage, or to get itself out of trouble. This jumping capacity is very much a tool for the mech, and the pilot within, to achieve battlefield supremacy over its intended targets. Mobility is the very fabric of every battle mech, and the rock is no different. Its ability to leap is vital to its combat performance. Just as vital to an assault mech as its movement profile is its protection, and the rock is not immune from needing to invest significantly in this aspect of mech design. In its base chassis, before taking into account its configurations, it does this in two ways. First, it has an armored cockpit, through the pod-like capsule that is in the interior of the cockpit itself. This does protect the rock from critical hits that would otherwise destroy the mech in a single blow. In other words, it protects the cockpit from a single critical hit in-game that would disable it through killing the pilot. Single is the key term to stress here. It only protects the head once. To defend the core chassis of the rock, though, it is encased in 18.5 tons of Kalon Rollstar standard armor plating yielding it 296 points of protection in-game. This level of armor is very heavy, being only just shy of an atlas. In the latter generations of Battletech, however, extra armor types and other bonuses can improve protection beyond just lump sums of armor points, much like the Aurel originally did, for instance. But the rock requires too much open space on board for Omnipods to allow any more advanced technologies. Instead, it must rely on its normal armor to see it through. Thankfully, 18.5 tons is still a fantastic amount of plating, and the mech can withstand quite the assault before it will go down to enemy fire. Its movement, defense, and core chassis features all play into each individual configuration and their intended roles, as will be demonstrated as we begin to examine the configurations themselves. Ammunition-based systems tend to scale much better with heavier mechs overall. They produce less heat, and as a mech gets bigger, they can afford more of these systems, and can often get more out of them than energy weapons. This is seen quite frequently with most rock configurations, though not all of them. The Rock Prime, the most consistently deployed variation of the rock, is a fire support battle mech with a strong mix of concentrated damage and heavy missile fires. Before going into its weaponry, it's important to note that the Prime does install an Angel ECM, for an extra layer of invisible protection for the mech, and to help conceal it from enemy sensors, as well as to reduce the effectiveness of certain enemy effects. With that out of the way, let's get to the guns. It comes with a right arm mounted Kraken EMT model KR1N 5 coil magnetic cannon, or rather, a Clantech Gauss rifle. The effectiveness of these reliable, heavy hitting weapons is almost never in question, nor should they be. It strikes for 15 damage and has a range of up to 22 hexes, and can either punch holes in enemy armor or decapitate enemy mechs in a single strike. Better yet, it even has the benefit of having a shocking 32 rounds of ammunition, meaning that this system can be used over protracted deployments, or even multiple missions, without running out of ammunition. Next, the Prime comes armed with twin left arm mounted Chrono C LRM-20 launchers with Artemis IV fire control systems, and each launcher has 3 tons of ammunition resulting in the rock having 18 rounds per launcher. As an important thing to point out, the ammunition is in both side torsos, but they are protected by Case 2 systems. 
making it unlikely for ammunition explosions to destroy the mech. These missiles pair exceptionally with Gauss systems, where the Gauss opens up the armor and the swarms of missiles plunge into opened plating and damaged surfaces. The last remaining systems the Prime has is a pair of clan quality diverse optics small pulse lasers, mounted under a sliding armored panel in the left torso. These lasers are there for doing away with infantry targets and other light forces that come too close. Importantly, the mech as a whole is entirely heat neutral. In its entirety, the Rock Prime delivers hellish barrages of missiles and high velocity gauss rounds into targets making it a superb direct fire and indirect fire mech. And it has enough ammunition for even the longest of engagements, or multiple battles and skirmishes. It is an ideal long range hammer for a protracted campaign. In terms of pilot preference, the most experienced rock pilots tend towards wanting to deploy the A configuration more so than the Prime. However, problems with availability of components can often result in this, unfortunately, not being possible. Still, the official A configuration of the Rock is an exceptionally powerful war machine, and has devastating mixed-range firepower for dealing with enemy targets. A direct engagement-based battle mech, it focuses on two primary weapons that pair superbly together in a deadly duo of destruction. In its left arm, and its main armor breaker is a Magna Starfire Plus Heavy Particle Projection Cannon with PPC Capacitor. This powerful kinetic asset will deliver blows that match AC-20 cannons, or even heavy Gauss rifles, when fired in alternating turns. Often though, in the thickest of fighting, the A will struggle to charge its capacitor while in an intense firefight. But even then, the Starfire Plus will deliver devastating attacks matching the damage of a clan ER PPC. Funnily enough, the original plan for the Rock was to gain access to clan ER PPCs, but it was found at the time that they needed to be imported in significant numbers, with little to no domestic manufacturing at this time, and that was something which Kalon and the Free Worlds League military wanted to avoid as a part of the standard issue configurations. While this is considered the main cannon though, there is in fact a far more terrifying weapon on board to support it. One of the most powerful offensive tools in this setting. Found in the right arm is the devastating tool of war that is even more feared, despite its secondary role. It is also the reason for the A configuration being less frequently viewed than the Prime. And that is its Kraken EMT KR-5V Colossal quad velocity magnetic cannons, or as it is more commonly known in game terms, the Hyper Assault Gauss Rifle 40. This incredibly powerful weapon can project a literal storm of iron on direct targets, and is perfectly married to the advanced heavy PPC the A configuration has. The PPC will open up holes in the enemy, and the Hag will shower the targets in blistering fire. It is intended to be a lethal combination between the two. And if that were not enough, the magnetic cannon is supported by 18 rounds of fire, meaning that it can have a protracted presence on the battlefield. For in-close engagements, and for causing horrendous damage to light vehicles and infantry units, the Rock's A configuration comes with a hellish 5 clan quality diverse optic small pulse lasers. Even more than the Prime with four in the left arm and one hidden within the center torso. These are in significant enough volume to even hinder enemy battle mechs should they get too close. But an infantry platoon would quickly be decimated should it fall within the mech's sights. It seems the rock's designers consider in this configuration, and many others, the role of secondary weapons to not just hinder close range attacks from mechs, but to deal with infantry and lighter assets in a very permanent way, with rapid pulses of scorching light. In total, the A configuration breaks open plating, before showering its opposition in hellish waves of gauss fire. And should anyone get close, it will illuminate them with blistering pulse fire. 
conceived for vicious close-range battles inside of urban areas or forests. The Rock B has the hardest single punching power of any single variant of this machine as of this time. Combining its jump abilities in dense terrain, as well as its advanced targeting features, the B can deliver hammer blows which will put down even the most fortified of mechs. After the Battle of Victory, it earned the nickname City Breaker amongst the AMU, which eventually spread to the Free World's League military and to the Free World's Guard as a common descriptor for it. To start with, it has an extra layer of invisible protection, much like the Rock Prime, in the form of an Angel ECM. This is even more helpful when in a forest or city, due to the mech concealing its presence further with terrain features. When it comes to firepower, there are few that can match the hurricane of destruction it will bring upon its entry into a fight. The main cannon on board is a right arm mounted Imperator Ultra AC-20 autocannon, which was sourced directly from its Atreus facilities. The gun drops intense barrages on targets that come within its ideal killing range, delivering two slugs at 20 damage in essence when firing in a rapid fire state. Kalon did try to source a Clantech equivalent for the weapon within the League, but they were unable to do so as of 3151, and so they went with a venerable manufacturer of weapon systems. This somewhat hinders the gun in terms of its size and overall effectiveness, however. Inevitably, this is an irrelevance, as when a target is lined up and takes two major strikes from this gun, they may simply be washed away in the fire it produces. It has 20 individual rounds for this mammoth of a cannon. Every other offensive option on board exists to enhance the primary gun in its dispatching of targets. In the left arm, for instance, the Rock B has five Pattern R6 SRM6 launchers. This means that the mech, every turn, can potentially deliver a horrifying 30 missiles into a target, after it's already been shattered by an Ultra AC-20. Of course, launchers will miss, and not every missile will deliver, but this is nonetheless a terrifying level of destruction. It has a shocking total of 75 individual missile attacks available from its 5 tons of ammunition too, which is hidden behind a Case 2 system, along with its AC-20 ammunition. What is very notorious is often, rock pilots will replace one ton of ammunition with the infamous Inferno Rounds in order to deliver waves of bombardment across whole areas, igniting buildings, forests, trenches, or other defense works that may be used by lighter forces. Finally, much like its prior counterparts, the Rock B has four Clantech small pulse lasers, also found in the left arm, for dealing with the same problems the other variants are meant to. This is especially important in cities and forests. To offset the last half ton of weight, it then backs these up with a single small laser. The B is noteworthy for not being able to properly bracket its fire, however, and at close range, should it alpha strike, while it won't overheat so wildly as to explode, it will start suffering from dehabilitating heat-related issues. Overall, the B is a monster to anything that dwells in a dense terrain region, where ranges are cut short regardless. When used effectively, this is its hunting ground, and when it spreads its wings and descends upon its foes, often battles will be shorter and unimaginably more destructive. Energy weaponry isn't truly the main focus of the rock more often than not. Most configurations are anchored, at the very least, in advanced ballistic, magnetic, or missile-based systems. The sea, however, is an exception and it is a magnificently dangerous battle mech in its own right, often used for mixed range, mixed terrain engagements, and the choice of pilots with a preference for energy-based systems. The C delivers a fantastic punch and is a great direct fire component of any heavy lance or formation. With its ability to clear 41 heat every turn, it definitely has two states of attack. One is focused on breakthrough punches, and the other is more linked to defensive close-range encounters. For its long-range striking power, it has a pair of Magna Starfire Plus heavy particle projection cannons with capacitors in the right arm. 
These cannons are typically fired together after the capacitor charges, and these deliver huge damage with each strike. It doubles up on what the A configuration does in this respect, and has the cooling to realistically do this whenever needed. Follow-up fire from LRM-based mechs, or other cluster damage fire from nearby allies, can result in gruesome outcomes for their enemies. Also, the cannons can clip through the head armor of enemy mechs, killing targets immediately unless they are using reflective or blue shield-based protection assets. To follow up this calamitous amount of particle-based weaponry, the Rock C then installs eight left-arm mounted pulse lasers. In the form of three Martel Extended Range Medium Pulse Lasers, or Medium X Pulse Lasers, as well as five Clan Small Pulse Lasers from diverse optics. This lets it hose down light mechs that might come to disrupt it, or even shred through infantry formations and light vehicles, basically acting as the mech's close-range parrying capability. Some pilots, if they have access to them, are known to swap out the three Medium X Pulse Lasers in favor of three Clan Medium Pulse Lasers, but as of 3155, limited to no availability of these systems to Kalon means that this is not officially available. The Roxy is a brutal dealer of death and will viciously puncture enemy units with highly charged particle rounds. It is also to be watched very carefully. Any attempt to use light harassers, especially in close, in order to distract, disable, or harass this giant is likely to end only in tragedy. One of the less frequent configurations of the rock typically observed is the Rock D, which is a unique mid-range fire support battle mech, specifically built as an alternative to the HAG configurations of the rock. This variant was designed largely due to the rarity of these much desired systems. The mech is very simple in its principles. Its primary armaments are a pair of Orient weaponry, rotary AC5 autocannons with one in each arm, and each having their own feed of four tons of ammunition. This masks out to a total of 160 rounds of fire, or 80 dedicated shots per cannon, allowing the mech to fire at the highest rate of expulsion of ammunition for more than 10 turns. Each set of ammunition is protected by a Case 2 system in order to safeguard the machine as well. All the same, a deluge of fire will be dispensed from its binary set of autocannons, and under the most favorable conditions, these guns will strike for 60 damage between the two of them, though this will rarely be the case. Jams are one problem the gun may face too, and their limited range of 15 hexes also puts the mech into situations where it may have to engage targets at shorter ranges, making it not a true sniper, but a mid-range juggernaut. Its remaining systems are a pair of torso-concealed medium X-Pulse lasers in the right and left sides, as well as four arm-mounted Clan Small Pulse lasers. These energy systems exist as accurate backup fire if targets get too close, and of course as a means of doing away with bothersome enemy light field assets. Overall, the D has a mixed reputation with its pilots, who often fear jams, or are frustrated by the RAC-5's relative shorter engagement ranges over preferred weapon systems. Still, when a HAG is not available, and large amounts of scatter damage are required. Often, they are delivered by the D. Originally, an unofficial configuration of the rock created by one of its infrequent pilots of the mech within the Orel Legion, mech warrior Visek Contempt Svatik. The E configuration is the rarest form of rock, and is considered by many to be the most dangerous of configurations. It is rare only because of a lack of available equipment, and it has the simplest weapons arrangement of any rock, as it only has two weapons. Svatik simply looked at the rock A, and asked why waste time with a heavy PPC, or even backup weaponry. Because of this, the rock E has simply a pair of Kraken EMT KR-5V Colossal Quad Velocity Magnetic Cannons, or HAG-40s, with 12 rounds of ammunition per cannon. These guns will simply overwhelm and shred through targets as if they were nothing, potentially hitting for 80 damage should both of these cannons land. Targets will be blasted away, being seemingly caught in a sandstorm of iron, moving faster than the speed of sound. 
between its reasonable jumping ability and the power to just simply sandpaper targets into nothingness, this is rightly the most feared battle mech in the lineup of these monsters. During the first use of the rock, Svatek brought his customized E when his Warhammer 2C was out of action, and used it to horrifying effect, being responsible for the majority of kills on the 109th Defense Cluster's binary and the Saphir River ambush. The E configuration was officially certified by Kalon Industries in 3155, though it is an extremely rare sight to see on the battlefield, if only due to a lack of Kraken's artisan-crafted hag systems within the League. During a victory parade on Atreus, a triumph over a significant victory over the Lyran Commonwealth, the first Free World's Guard had one of these mechs at the head of the parade, marching alongside Giuliano through the streets of the capital. A specialist configuration of the rock, and one rarely seen outside of dedicated urban or forest environments. Kalon itself does not promote the mech very much either, outside of advertising that the configuration exists, and stating that full details will only be made available to potential operators and buyers of the equipment to field the configuration. It would only be in 3156 that it would become publicly known, causing outrage even amongst the most jaded of free world citizens even if it was somewhat quieted by the dire situation the League was in between so many enemies and conflicts. That is because the Rock R has a very sinister setup of weapons, even if it only has four of them. While its damage output against mechs is moderate for its tonnage, and in comparison to other Rock configurations, it is still respectable, and it adds effects to enemy mechs that cannot be ignored either. So simply put, it has four Flametech Inferno plasma rifles, with two in each arm, in total, it has 8 tons of ammunition, resulting in it having 80 individual shots between the four rifles. These do terrible things to infantry and vehicles, as well as other soft targets, such as support staff, or even non-combatants. They also do reasonable amounts of damage to mechs, the same as a standard PPC, along with the benefit of generating excess heat on the target. There is no real drawback to this weapon, beyond public perception. The League government has actively denied purchasing and using this configuration, though there was footage of the first Free World's Guard, seemingly deploying these mechs against a holdout Wolf Empire stronghold in 3155, which began the process of the mech being publicly disclosed as to its existence. For the League's part, they claim the video was doctored. Overall, the R is a nightmare in close-range conditions, and built-up areas, and is ghoulishly effective against non-mech targets. Prior to his death, Jaromir Milan would have been unable to conceive how his project could have taken such a wild turn. The army of the Merrick Stewart Commonwealth's Orel was more graceful and specialized than what would become the Free World's League's rock. But nonetheless, it was his vision that was eventually used by Kalon Industries to forge this mighty eagle into reality. The hurdles along the way almost saw it fall into the dustbin of history even. However, much like the League, through perseverance, hard work, and new ways of approaching problems, Kalon Industries created the ultimate, versatile breakthrough battle mech, which now sees success within the most battle-hardened and veteran formations inside of the Free World's League military. A new generation of battle mech, using the most sophisticated technologies available to the League, and being built to bring down its advanced clan counterparts, or at least participating in anchoring them and bringing them into their true destruction, The Rock became a wildly successful financial win for the company that created it. More importantly, it became a vital asset to those who commissioned it in the Free World's League military. House Merrick would see it used in the worst fighting in their latest war with their occupying neighbor. While it is not the face of the League's military, like the Giuliano is more traditionally. The Rock, and its growing profile inside of the military and society, presents hope in many ways. It is an example of raging against the darkness. It reflects that the League would advance, technologically, by any means necessary, and place the greatest emphasis on matching their real enemies in the Empire, more than any other consideration. 
Its battlefield performance against the best that Othar's Empire could throw at it displayed its effectiveness. But there is no such thing as a perfect mech, and the rock is far from it. For ease of maintenance and for much of its omnipod space, its main weapons are almost always arm-mounted. To keep up with mobility parameters, it spends generously on tonnage and critical space on a partial wing system. It lacks specialized armor in an era where it is becoming more frequent. But for these faults, it is counterbalanced by its extremely heavy and technologically sophisticated firepower, which is like nothing any other League mech can bring to the table as of its development. Better yet, its extremely sophisticated onboard targeting system goes to show just how much of an effort was placed into its concept as well. And despite not having specialized armor, it is still tough enough to stand up and fight almost any other mech in its weight class, shot for shot. An image was captured in the final day of fighting across Victoria City, which displayed the rock as piloted by mech warrior Contempt, standing over the shattered and broken battle mech of the killed Star Colonel Aminelia of Clan Wolf, as he completed the destruction of the Stormcrow, which had been the last of her star, piloted by mech warrior Yurik the first soldier to survive an encounter with the machine. This image became a propaganda boon across the League, instilling courage into the war effort and driving people to resist across the occupied territories. The rock itself has become affiliated with this imagery. A colossus standing over the fallen enemies of the Free World's League and fighting to protect its people to the end. The reality of the brutality of the battle and campaign need not be remembered by anyone. Only the imagery remains, and the meaning behind it. The Rock is to many inside of the League, the manifestation of the Phoenix their state has rightly become. It may be unfair to point out that while the Merrick family has a history that goes back to Eastern Europe's Middle Ages, so does the family of Vlad Dracul. Excerpt from Revolution, Merricks, and You. A very special thanks to the following three channel members. And this is some of the comments they wanted to leave you for this very special video. Besker66 says, The computer says it's a warhammer! It's not a warhammer, dammit! What is it? Grammatron3000 says, Alaric stood there, shirtless, gleaming in the moonlight. He looked at me with his majestic blue eyes. His beauty unmatched. Dapper Raccoon says, Looking into her piercing blue eyes, he could see the strength that others lacked. Here stood a leader that would change the course of history. Unquestionably, only Nicole Hallis Hughes Merrick, his Captain General, had the greatness to bring glory to a reborn Free Worlds League. I'm not gonna lie, those last two comments were put in here just to troll me. <laughs> Thank you all for joining me here today. I knew this was going to be a longer video. First of all, it's something that I myself got to write, and I didn't need to consistently check between resources and the core thing that I was writing about. Because frankly, it's just my homebrew stuff. It's close enough that it doesn't need to be exact in every respect in terms of the mainstream lore too. That's why there's the disclaimer at the front. This is not official in any way. That didn't mean though that it didn't take time to figure out who made each item inside of the mech, of course. Because I did do my best to try to properly source everything that could go inside of it. There is a broad, very broad overview of what may become a rock and a hard place as a story in the future, too, with the Battle of Jlen, though this is very much a bird's eye take here, in this video, and may not track with what things might look like at the ground level, 
I hope I get the opportunity to make that video the way I want, but that'll be for next year probably. For those of you that are curious as to why I did this, the answer is simple. I wanted a mech that was identifiable with the channel specifically. The League is my favorite faction, so making a mech for it, filling a niche that they currently don't have, and making a backstory based around corruption, manufacturing issues, ambition, and military procurement was fun for me, because I'm a pretty boring person. Even if all of these facts were just put together to assemble it for this video. It let me stretch some long, dormant intellectual muscles as well, which was nice. The artwork and design for The Rock were done by the incredible Alan Blackwell, who is one of the on-contract artists for Catalyst Game Labs. And I want to send a huge thank you out to him. It was a fascinating process, and he was incredibly easy to work with. He really did bring my vision of the mech to life, and it was just truly fantastic to see. This channel project took almost a year in total, from concept to completion. With things streamlined more effectively now, it is something I want to do once a year, every year, if I'm able to. For next year, there are plans to do a Blessed Order Super Heavy, the Bale, at least loosely anyway. But yes, this is the mascot for the channel. This is the mech that you see at the end of my videos and my avatar on various websites, and it will continue to be. To me personally, it represents a huge leap forward for the channel and it's really the manifestation of a lot of love that I have for the setting. If you're wondering where the rules can be found, as of right now, they are on the channel Discord, in its mech sheet form. I work seven days a week on the channel, which is not an exaggeration, and this video really does feel like an accomplishment, at least to me. It feels like years of work coalescing into a video that reflects where I've been. Thank you, everyone, for joining me in this journey so far. For those wondering if I will be selling miniatures or 3D files for this, the answer is no. It would just overcomplicate my life doing so. I also don't support people making their own 3D renders of it. If they do, that's their choice, but know that it is done without my consent or permission. That doesn't mean The Rock won't be making its way out into the wild though. I am planning next year on getting some of these made, and they will be distributed as giveaways by the channel. No memberships or anything required, the raffles will be done through the channel Discord. When and why and how, I haven't decided yet. I will have to see overall, of course, if we can make this work, but that is the actual running plan. There have also been people on various live streams and social media asking me to petition to make this mech cannon or something like that. I didn't make this for that purpose, but if CGL wants it, they can basically have it. They just have to email me and it's literally all theirs. Now with that said, and to be clear, this is extremely unlikely to ever be considered. Battletech does all of their mechs and imagery in-house for designs, so please don't pester them about this. Alright, I think I answered any questions people might have about this. A huge shout out to the folks from the community message section, which are Besker66, Dapper Raccoon, and Grammatron3000. Also a huge shout out to Scanman as well, who did not want a message put inside of that. Also another shout out to Kizvak123 and Jailguard Negative for having created fan art of The Rock. Uh, I've never had fan art done for me in any capacity before ever, so having three pieces of fan art done for the channel has actually been pretty cool. So thank you guys too. If you liked this content, I hope you hit like and subscribe if you're new here. I make content like this quite frequently, and if you liked this, you'll like the rest of it too. Also, if you want to support my channel further, have you considered becoming a YouTube channel member? Channel memberships are the main way I've kept the channel going in its current form, and it keeps me from needing to do anything like sponsors in any of my videos. It means that my voice is just my own, and I do my best to be accountable to members and deliver for you guys all that I can. In fact, channel memberships and community support are what made this video literally possible in almost every sense. If you do want to support, feel free to hit the join button on the YouTube application, either in browser or on your phone, and it should prompt you with various options. Thank you all for your support. I really mean it. So, as I say all the time and as I mean it this time especially, this content is literally only made possible by viewers like you. And with all of that out of the way, what did you think of The Rock? Did you enjoy this homebrewed mech video? 
let me know in the comment section below and consider sharing this video with others because I get the feeling that it's going to have a bit of a rough time on YouTube in terms of viewership as it's not really an official anything. Still, I hope you all have a great day and I will catch you in the comments section below.